I'm breaking down, gonna start from scratch Shake it off like an etch a sketch My lips are saying goodbye My eyes are finally dry Um, could you tell us your name, degree and what year you're in? Yeah, so my name's Lara Sonnenschein I'm in my third year studying political economy and I'm a member of the Grassroots Collective on campus. Cool, and what's the name of the campaign that you're running with and what colour? So I'm running under Grassroots and we're running on green. Cool, um, and so you mentioned you were a member of Grassroots. How long have you been in Grassroots and why did you join it? So I've been in Grassroots for probably around a year now. I joined around last year's election. I joined Grassroots because I feel that the collective most aligns with sort of my values, um, which I see to be left wing and sort of like to the left of the major political parties. Um, and I wanted to join an activist collective. So are you a member of any political party? No. Okay. And in terms of how you are left wing of the major political parties, can you give us an example of something that you support that you don't think the major political parties do? Um, I think there's sort of a few things. I mean, I think there are some things where I would sort of align with the Greens and I would vote for the Greens in an election, but I do see myself as um, to the left of the Greens. So, I don't know, I guess an example would be, off the top of my head, like decriminalisation of all drugs or, you know, things around free education, which the Greens support but which Labor wouldn't. So, things like that. Okay. And who's your political hero? Um, I don't really have a, a political hero per se. I'm not sort of someone who looks up to a particular figure. Um, I sort of more um, see myself, like see the interest in social movements as opposed to, to looking up to one particular figure. What would be an example of like a big social movement that you admire? Um, I guess like the movement for, for free education, the recent movement for, for marriage equality, the movement against fee deregulation, those are sort of recent things that spring to mind. Okay. Um, so why are you running for SRC president? Yeah, so I think first and foremost I'm running because I see a real sort of importance uh, uh, of student unionism and I really think I represent you know, those values of sort of representation and activism and dissent. And I think I would want I would be a president that embodies sort of those values and that really fights for students' rights and carries on that legacy of student unionism. And I think in my role as education officer this year, I've you know had experience like facilitating the largest on-campus collective, the EAG, um, and I've had a lot of sort of campaigning experience. And I think to that point, I think that the fight against Ramsey is sort of a broader fight for a better university and a university that isn't sort of beholden to the interests of politicians or corporations, but is one that is sort of beholden to students. And I see the SRC as an organisation and as like the peak student union as sort of the conduit for change for facilitating that student response against uni management. Isn't there a lot more to the SRC than like just activism though? I mean, there's a whole casework service here. Would you be a president who just ignored, ignored the services side of things? No, definitely not. So I think there are sort of, I guess like three main functions of the SRC. So firstly, there's obviously the service provision side of the SRC. So that's the, the free casework and legal service that the SRC offers. And I think that's crucial. And that's, you know, individual, it's personalised, it's tailored to that particular student and that is something that I am like deeply committed to and I've used sort of both of those services myself. Um, then I think you have the sort of activism side of things which is collectives and like facilitating on campus organising. And then I guess the third sort of role you have as president is to sort of act as that medium between the university and sort of the general student body and to be that representative you know, in the boardroom with them. So no, I definitely uh, wouldn't reject the services side. I just see activism as important too. Do you have any policies that address how the services side of things function? Yeah, so I think in terms of the services side of things, Grassroots has long um, sort of stood for uh, a lawyer that is specialised in sexual assault and that is something that the legal team 
themselves support. So that's something that I would like to prioritize if I was elected. Um, so what do you see as like the greatest achievement of the SRC in the past five years? What would you label as the most important? greatest achievement? I think it's hard to sort of like pin down to one thing, but I think, and this isn't just to the Sydney Uni SRC alone, I think it's sort of to the SRC at UCID playing a crucial role and then also NUS and other student unions around the country. And I think that was the fight against fee deregulation and students mobilising against that. And I see that pushback and that mobilisation of students at a sort of unseen you know, level in previous years as the greatest achievement of student unionism more broadly in the past few years. Cool. And on the flip side, like, what do you think the low point of the SRC has been? Or what's the biggest thing that you change? In terms of this year or, like, generally in, in general, the past in five the past, years? So five years. I think um, generally it would sort of be the kind of, like, hack cycle and, and seeing the SRC as this stepping stone into party politics or into a union job and, you know, therefore not prioritising the SRC as an organisation but prioritising one's own career. And we've, we've sort of seen that with recent presidents, um, you know, having, you know, two jobs, working at the SRC and working at a union. And I think, you know, if I were elected, I would want to work nine to five hours. I would not be undertaking any units of study and I would be fully committed to this job. So I think it's that, you know, treating the SRC just as, you know, another sort of job you have. So do you find, do you identify any problems with, in terms of like the operation of the SRC um, at the moment? I think the SRC at the moment is sort of functioning quite well. And is this sort of a question more broadly to Imogen's presidency? Yeah, or? we can get to that. We can, um, what, what would be the greatest problems you want? you would identify in Imogen's leadership okay. then. So obviously I think it's like no secret that Imogen and I are cut from like the same broad left ideological cloth. So we obviously have a lot in common. And I think she's been a great president in the sense of leading a very active SRC, being very involved in, in you know, grassroots campaigns um, and things like that and being a strong voice to uni management. On what I'd sort of do differently to Imogen, I think... A big problem sort of I've noticed this year is a lot of councillors and office bearers sort of being not like left in the dark but being a bit confused as to how to you know effectively run a campaign or, or things like that so I think one thing I would change is the orientation process that we currently have so currently it's sort of like a one day nine to two model um, but you really can't cover everything in you know what is that five hours um, so I think having like a three day kind of orientation process where you cover all sort of the bureaucratic skills of how do you print and you know how do you make a leaflet and things like that but you also go into how do you write a press release how do you like get your campaign to have media attention and I think that's something that I would definitely like to implement if elected next year I also think I'd like to activate sort of what are seen as like the smaller departments of sort of like the more minor office bearers so I think like one thing that would come to mind is maybe like the welfare department or you know something like that. Um, so I know at the Newcastle Uni Student Union, um, they had a very successful implementation last year of um, pill testing kits for students, and it was so successful that they've like ordered a whole bunch more this year and have made them like multi-use kits as opposed to single-use kits. Mm -hmm. And that's been something that has been really effective in engaging more of sort of like the broad student body as opposed to just like the typical SRC milieu of people into the union. So I think that is something that I'd sort of want to change to. And as far as activating smaller departments goes, it all comes down to funding, I guess, which I think we all know is pretty tight. There was a 250 or something dollar surplus yeah. this year. I mean, where would you get the funding for like initiatives like that? Yeah, so I don't think... So I think obviously like funding is an issue, but most of the time office bearers don't actually use all of their funding. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is, is that there's also a council sort of like resources pool, which has about $6,000, which people can dip into, um, you know, if need be. So obviously 
like more money is always better, but mm. you've got to work with what you've got. And I think there is still room for great initiatives, you know, to be implemented with the money that we have now. Speaking of working with what you've got, if, for example, the university cut staff by fifty thousand dollars next year, yeah. where would you where would you make those savings? What yeah. would you cut from current operations? Okay. So obviously that's like a situation I'd want to avoid and sure. commit to avoiding. But were it were it to be the case, I think firstly you could save about twenty thousand dollars from uh, cutting NUS like travel subsidies for non delegates. So that'd be like to the NatCon conference and to EdCon, um, as well as conference registration. So that'd be about twenty K. And then from there on, in terms of flexible expenditure you're really looking at cutting from collectives and NUS affiliation. I definitely wouldn't want to be cutting from staff wages. I think we have an obligation to our staff. Um, we are a union and I wouldn't want to be cutting from their wages. So I think that's where the flexible expenditure is. Just quickly on cutting um, NUS subsidies on NACON subsidies, would you cut on ease subsidy to attend NACON? No. Okay. Um, and with NUS, would you... If you're if you didn't have to cut, if you were just president next year, would you increase the affiliation fee or decrease it? Okay, um, I think I would probably keep it at current levels. Um, I don't think I would decrease affiliation unless I were in a situation where SAF, you know, was massively decreased. But if we were sort of roughly in the same position we are now, I think I would keep it at the same level. Um, and just jumping back to problems with the operation of the SRC, you mentioned careerists, um, you know, being counsellors and that kind of thing. What would you kind of do to help the issue of quorum in council, which is obviously a very ongoing issue of councillors not attending, councillors being disengaged? What's yeah. your plan to fix that? I think quorum is a huge issue. And sadly, I don't think it's one that I can probably alone fix. I know that Imogen went into this year thinking that... Um, you know, she could really fix that. And I know that she has done a lot of work in trying to remedy that problem. So there's, she's, you know, created Facebook events, you know, message, you know, messaging like every counsellor, you know, with like personalised messages telling them to come. But at the end of the day, it's up to those counsellors to come and there's only so much you as president can do. I think one thing that I think sort of it could be improved again sort of stems back to the orientation process so at the orientation process really explaining what being a councillor means I think sort of some people just see it as okay you run in an election and then you're on council and that's it and they're not really prepared for what is you know often quite a heated sort of political debate that goes on for hours and that's not for everyone so I think making clear those expectations um yeah um I suppose another question about day-to-day -day operations about of the SSA. One of the president's other roles is to DSP Oni. Um, as you probably know, we published a controversial article by Jay Tharapel last week, yeah. which uh, was perceived as pro-North Korean. If you, that article had come across your DSPing desk, if you were president, would you have approved it? Yeah, so I would have approved it. I strongly believe, you know, whilst I am DSP, I strongly believe in Oni's autonomy to publish what they want you know about who they want so long as it's not defamatory i also think that oni has quite a crucial role as part of the student union in you know offering those different perspectives as a student newspaper i don't think it's it's a perspective that i particularly agree with um but that being said i don't think that should hinder it from being published so i would have published it if i were the president and acting as dsp and just on in terms of, you know, your similarity to Imogen, a lot of your policies kind of build upon active or existing SRC campaigns. So if you were president next year, are we just expecting to see kind of a repeat of Imogen's presidency or are there kind of new initiatives or like fresh ideas that you, you think you have in your policy? Yeah, so something new which I definitely, you know, would want to act on as president is a campaign around sort of disarming the university. So this is something that sort of stemmed from an FOI, which I wrote an ONI article about. Um, and then from there on, it sort of got a bit of traction in national media. And I spoke to student activists around the country. And then I, along with a few other people, founded a national network called Disarm Universities, which seeks to sort of sever those ties between arms manufacturers and universities. 
So I think that's something, that's a campaign that I would want to prioritise that is, like, I guess, distinct from what Imogen ran on. Um, and I think, you know, that would involve a combination of sort of lobbying the university and, you know, more protest direct action kind of things of getting the university to divest on the one hand and then getting the university to cut weapons research. Is an activist focus like this one that's just going to alienate more students from the SRC? I don't think so. So I think that the services like that the SRC offers are for everyone and I don't think that me being an activist would stop people from accessing those services. On the other hand, I think that most students would generally characterise themselves as sort of like left-wing or progressive. So I don't think I'm alienating voters or students in that way. Um, I think, you know, a recent poll showed that I think it was like 58% of young people, you know, like socialism basically and see capitalism as a flawed system. So I think recent polling sort of shows that young people and by natural extension students are left-wing and progressive, so I don't think I'm alienating, you know, voters and students. And then sort of, like, further to that, the election is sort of, like, this political contest. It's a democratic kind of contestation of ideas. If people think I'm too left-wing, they won't vote for me, and they'll vote for someone else. I guess the issue is that the kind of student that then engages in SRC events like an election perhaps is one who is more left-wing because the most visible activity that the SRC engages in is protesting on campus. So the kind of narrative which I think you see more commonly in UCID-based platforms like UCID Rants, which is that protests are just a disruption. I come to uni to get my degree yeah. is probably one that increased protest activity feeds into. Are you going to conciliate with those students or offer something for them? So I think I would like kind of reject the notion of, you know, people more in the centre or to the right of politics being disengaged. I think we've seen that recently. There's been a real sort of surge in liberal engagement with the SRC in the past sort of two years. So I think that sort of like dispels that myth to a degree and then what was the second part was it re well how are you going to engage with students who currently are shut off to the SRC and by that do you mean like right-wing students or I mean in general given that there are nearly 34,000 undergraduate students and only about 3,500 vote in SRC election and far fewer use SRC services yeah presumably there's there's a lot of people you could reach out to what are you going to do to achieve that. Okay, so I think like in terms of reaching out, I think reaching out via the service provision that the SRC offers is obviously a thing that is for everyone. And I think that's something that Imogen has done quite well this year in terms of having, you know, frequent SRC stalls on Eastern Avenue and talking to students, not on a political level, but on a purely like service based level of this is the casework service, this is legal service, you can get a fifty dollar loan. So I think that's one way of engaging with sort of disenfranchised students. And then I think, you know, I'm just going to be honest, I don't think there's a way that you can ever appeal to all students. You know, I I would be lying if I said I could do that. And I think any other candidate who says they can have this broad mass appeal with all students would be lying. I think students have often very distinct and, you know, formed political views. And I'm running on a mandate. And if people, you know, support that mandate, that's the mandate. You know, but if your mandate, gonna... if your mandate is a kind of confessedly political one, do you risk turning some students away from the non-political side of the SRC if those students don't agree with your your left-wing activist platform? I don't think it would dissuade students from using the free services. Cool. Just to clarify, in terms of Imogen being more front-facing on Eastern mm-hmm. Avenue, can you identify what like what events she's run on Eastern Avenue other than like Welfare Week or or Rat End Week? So, I th- like, in aside from sort of, like, those two weeks, there's just been, like, stalls on Eastern Avenue, which is just an SRC store with no event necessarily taking place, where it's just literally just talking to students about services that the SRC provides. So that's not an event. That's just going up to random students, talking to them, handing them a leaflet, and telling them about what the SRC offers. Um, so in terms of your policies, like a lot of them or all of them are pretty much based on activism or protest. Do you think there's any other way to achieve positive change without those avenues? Yeah, so I think a combination of sort of direct action and lobbying is how we've seen 
change of like change being made at the university so those are sort of like the two avenues that I see so do you have any policies to do with lobbying or um, like mediation kind of yeah so I think like one example of like lobbying the university would be around disarming the university that's one that comes to mind another one would be about you know divesting from fossil fuels so you are willing to kind of pursue non-activist pathways yeah definitely I mean I'm not someone who wants to like hobnob with university management because that's not how I see effective change being made but I am obviously willing to sit down with them and to lobby the university do you think you'll like you personally will be well placed to actually sit down with the university given that you've been very critical not just of its current stances but of, of actual individuals like for instance Chancellor Belinda Hutchinson within the administration do you think that you'll be able to cultivate good relations with the kinds of boards you have to sit on as president yeah I mean at the end of the day like firstly I have to cultivate those good relationships uh, I think I am a fairly personable person and I think despite those you know, severe sort of political differences, I will be able to communicate sort of my points across in such a fashion um, to, to try and get them on side, at least to some degree. Okay. Um, in terms then of your views of like other operators in the political space, yep. what are your kind of, what kind of role do you see the SRC as having as far as international students go? I mean, are, are there particular issues that you would turn the SRC's resources towards that might improve international students' experience of campus? Yeah, so I think a really positive thing I think we've seen recently is international student engagement with student politics, which really sort of started, I guess, with COCO in 2016 and was pretty much not there beforehand. Um, so I think now it's really good that you know, we have about, I think it's like about 25% of councillors on the SRC are international students, and that's, you know, pretty reflective of the demographic. I think this year the SRC has been quite good in terms of engaging with the international student community, both in the sense that, you know, they have representation on the council and in office bearer positions, so it's led to, you know, collaboration on things like the Opal Card campaign. It's led to the first translation of, of Counter Course, uh, which like me, Nina and Lily, you know, and Yushan put together in Chinese. Um, so I think things like that are sort of improvements to helping international students engage with the SRC. Uh, yeah. So what, what do you want to do next year? Next year? Yeah. Um, I think I would just sort of build off those existing, existing relationships um, and consult with international student communities more so I'm obviously not an international student myself but there are sort of a few issues which I see as as crucial to international students which I would obviously want you know their voice on but those are sort of things like you know wage theft you know um, in their workplaces things around housing uh, and then I guess sexual assault at universities international students uh, you know um, overrepresented in those statistics so those are sort of things that I see as crucial. You mentioned consultation there um, one of I think your main kind of non-activist focused policy is setting consultation hours for the president at least as far as your policy statement went. Yep. Um, how would that policy work? Well I think it's basically as simple as setting aside you know two hours a week or whatever whatever it is whatever I can sort of fit timetable wise publicizing that on the SRC Facebook page, on the SRC um, you know, website itself, and being like, you know, from two to four on Thursday, um, you can drop into my office with any queries, questions, concerns you have. Cool. Um, and yeah, you, um, in terms of your policy statement that was submitted, there aren't really any policies about the SRC's services like casework, legal service and visa support, but you mentioned that you wanted to um, you know, have an additional role in the legal service. Can you talk us through some of the policies you have that aren't activist um, activism or protest focused? Yep, so as I mentioned earlier, um, sexual assault solicitor, I think, is a big one. Um, yeah, I think it's basically just about publicising the SRC services to, to that broad sort of massive, massive people. Um, I don't think, 
um, there's a huge amount of money so that we can actually, you know, um, fundamentally change how the organisation works. I think it runs fairly well at the moment. Um, so, yeah. so in terms of publicising it more, can you give us some more examples other than, you know, having a stall on Eastern Avenue? Yeah. Um, well, I think, like, something could be, like, maybe more more articles in Oni about the SRC, you know, combined with SRC stores, combined with, like, utilising the Facebook page, you know, to it, you know. Well, I think Imogen's used that quite well. But those are just things that I can think of off the top of my head that would, you know, give that sort of more mass appeal. I think that's about what we had. Um, so thanks very much for the interview and for your no time. Worries. And best of luck with the rest of the campaign. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Cool. All righty. Good. Cool. Um, so that, yeah, it kept, it kept filming. Yeah. Nice. That's good. Thank you. Right, this is the top one on top, I think. Yeah. yeah.